sorry, I'm a little under the weather, still recovering uh, from an illness this past week. You know, when, when Michael told me that there was going to be this dad jokes uh, video before I came up, I'm like, oh, great. Now I'll, I'll bring the, the mood down. He's like, well, we all have our gifting. So here I am, you know, <laughs> trying, trying to bring my giftings. But you just know, okay, you're dealing with a section of scripture where a guy is going to be die, uh, is going to die by being eaten by worms from the inside out. That's not going to be a happy scripture, okay? Just setting the stage right up front. But before before we dive into that, as Brandon likes to note, I like to bring some context, right? Context, context, context. What's going on in this situation? And for some of this, we're going to go back to the end of. Acts chapter 11, and if you want to follow along, we're actually going to be in Acts chapter 12, verses 20 through 25, the end of the chapter. But uh, at the end of chapter 11, we have Barnabas and Saul in Antioch with the followers of Jesus there, and they hear from a prophet who has come up from Jerusalem that there's going to be this famine, and it's going to impact the whole world, and their response is one of generosity. They, they decide to, to take an offering and give it by the hand of Saul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to support their brothers and sisters there. So Saul and Barnabas take this offering and head to Jerusalem to, to deliver it. And then we, we have this encounter with uh, King Herod, and he kills James in the beginning of chapter 12, martyrs him. And because he sees how the Jews react to this, like, they're happy to see this. It's like, oh, hey, that's a way to some more popularity. So he decides to arrest Peter and intends to do the same thing to him. And without going through everything that we talked about last week, didn't quite work out. You know, Peter is released miraculously through God's hand. Where we catch up in verse 20, Herod, this, this same king, He's upset with these people in Tyre and Sidon. We don't know why exactly, just that he's considered that they've done something to offend him, right? He has some beef with them. And uh, we're going to pick it up there. If you want to read it on the screen, it should be up there. Acts 12, 20. Now, Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they sent... um, a delegation to make peace with him um, because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food, right? So he was their meal ticket. The delegates uh, won the support of Blastus, who was Herod's personal assistant. And an appointment was made with with Herod. And when the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, you know, kind of all this pomp and circumstance, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread. And there were many new believers. And when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, so they were present when all this was happening in Jerusalem, uh, they returned back to Antioch, taking John Mark with them. Now, I was thinking about this. I mean... On the surface, it, it seems pretty pretty clear and, you know, what's going on. You know, King Herod, he's all after the popularity. Like, that's what he values most. And he loved receiving that flattery from them. Like, that's exactly what he wanted to hear. There's a, a historian, some of you might have heard of, his name is Josephus. He was a Jewish historian lived in first century Palestine during this this time. All this is happening, recording what's going on. Now, to be clear, he is not a follower of Jesus. And he also records this happening. 
And this is what he wrote. Herod, having reigned three years over all Judea, went down to Caesarea and there exhibited shows and games in honor of Claudius. Now that was Claudius Caesar. If we remember at the end of uh, Acts uh, chapter 11, this, this uh, famine was going to happen during the time of Claudius Caesar, right? Which is from 41 AD to 54 AD. So we have a, a time range. This is approximately 10 to 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I love this because it anchors it in history. Like, this isn't just uh, words on a page. Like, these are real lives, real people, real places. And so he continues. So, uh, games in honor of Claudius and made vows with his health, which is interesting because Claudius was known for having lots of health issues. On the second day of these shows, he put on a garment made wholly of silver, and of a contexture most truly wonderful, and came into the theater early in the morning, at which the time of the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the first reflection of the sun's rays, shone out after a surprising manner, and was so resplendent as to spread a horror over those who looked intently upon him. And presently his flatterers cried out, one from one place and another from another, he is a god, and they added, be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. Nor did the king rebuke them, nor reject their impious flattery. But looking up, he saw an owl on a certain rope over his head, and immediately conceived that this bird was to him a messenger of ill tidings." He was filled with remorse and seized with violent pain in his bowels, exclaiming to his friends, Your God is already come to his life's end, and he whom you saluted immortal is going away to die. To such a height did the pain rise that he had to be carried hastily into his palace, where after a few days he expired in his 54th year. And it it's interesting to me from this secular historical uh, document. Like he knew, like he knew right away. Oh, crud. Like everything that he had chased after didn't really mean anything. All the things that he had elevated that were important to him at the end of the day, kind of meaningless if it costs you your life. And I got to thinking about this, you know, most of us aren't kings, most of us aren't wearing silver robes, at least I haven't seen them lately, no, all right. <laughs> so this can be difficult to connect with, but I, I believe God was kind of helping me along and putting something out on, on Tuesday of this week, he's like, Herod wasn't the only one that was sacrificing literally everything to place something that is not God himself in God's place. See, the people of Tyre and Sidon, they wanted their meal ticket, and they were willing to bow down to Herod to get it. Like, they were willing to do whatever they had to do to feed their stomachs. And I, I think that's something that's super relatable. Because whether it's food, or whether it's a promotion, or whether it's anything in our lives. Like, there's always this temptation to put things that are not God into the place that only he belongs. And so, <laughs> even though I was kind of joking, like, bring, bring the mood down, like, this is an opportunity for reflection. You know, we're, we're entering into this tra transition, right, as a church. We're, we're pulling up our tent, we're, we're moving we also have an opportunity to ask questions. What am I holding on to that I really don't need to hold on to? What are the things that I think are necessary that are not really necessary God is asking me to let go of? What are the things that I've placed in the place that only he belongs? You know, I have a, a, a good friend. He's also my boss at my day job. He was a pastor at, also at one point in time, and he, he shared with me 
you know, during his time as a pastor that the building that they were at became like an idol. You know, because things became about taking care of the building. Now, sure, there's absolutely important things about being a good steward, and we should be good stewards, 100%. But when their attention started focusing away of what it was that God had for them to do, be disciples and make disciples, to how do we keep this building going, something started to drift. And as we go through this transition, we have that opportunity to ask the questions, where perhaps are we or am I or whatever, individually, corporately, together, need to realign with God to where he's at and what he's doing and, and what he wants to do going forward. You know, encouraged by Amy, you know, this morning, and, and we, we all have that choice to make. Like, we're on the inside, he's knocking. We have a choice to let him in and let him show us what are the things that he wants us to give over to him? He's not going to take them. He, he's a gentleman. But he is going to say, hey, what about this? And so as we enter into our, our time of conversation at our tables, I want to encourage us, like, now's the time for transparency. Now's the time to, to dig in, to do the hard work that... Jesus is leading us to do. You know, he wants intimacy with us, first and foremost. And it is through that relationship, through that intimacy that he desires with us that he can do everything that he wants to do. And it's, it's amazing if we're gonna open that door and let him have his way. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you I thank you for your word. I thank you for the examples of your word, Lord, that you're inviting us in to take a, a good look, a good hard look, and, and lay everything before you. Lord, we, we want you to lead. Help us to let you lead, Lord. <laughs> if there's an area where I believe, but help my unbelief, please help me to see that. We love you and we thank you, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.